Warning. The following episode contains subject matter and scenes that some viewers may find upsetting, disturbing, or unnerving. Please note viewer discretion is advised at all times. Sit back and enjoy. July 7th, 2007. Two 14-year-old school friends, Vadim and Andre, make special efforts to wake up before sunrise in order to travel to the nearby Kilchen River. The boys plan on spending the day at the river in order to catch fresh fish to bring home to their mothers. Without a care in the world, the boys meet and meander off into the darkness through the silent countryside roads of Pidorodny. As the boys make their way into a heavily wooded section of the road just a few metres from the river, a green Daewoo taxi cab overtakes them and aggressively pulls to a halt. Two silhouettes exit the vehicle and stand in the middle of the road, motionless. The figures do not move. Nervously, the young boys try to pass. They are met with sudden and vicious force, which throws them from their cycles and a frantic, frenzied attack ensues. Vadim manages to flee and spends the rest of the early morning's darkness hiding in the nearby woods. Andre wasn't so lucky. The sounds of hysterical laughter and deranged exclamations pierce through the pine, along with the glare of the Daewoo's headlights. Vadim cowers in cover as Andre is brutalised. The maniacs strike again. The attacks not only become more frequent and more heinous, but they also become more documented. Known globally on gore sites as the evil behind three guys, one hammer, the maniacs continue to upload, continue to attack, and continue to run free. Hello and welcome back to I Can Murder a Podcast. I'm joined, of course I am. He's still next to me. It is Ben. It's good to see you. It's good. You're still here. Why is that? Um, well, um, we're kind of obligated. Because we do a podcast together. Ta-da! <laughs> ah! Oh, shocker! Spoiler alert! Oh, dear me. Um, so, Ben, I know you're very excited mm. about the T-shirt you're wearing. <laughs> Anyway, before we get started, a word from our sponsors. We want to take a moment to thank our brand new sponsor, Surfshark. Little old us with a sponsor, hey? Surfshark is a VPN app and browser extension that gives you access to an unbelievable amount of things. Now, when me and Ben do research for these episodes, we sometimes encounter websites we can't access because of our location. But Surfshark is here to save the day. So with Surfshark, you can change your virtual location with just a couple of clicks, allowing you to unblock content. Now, this isn't all. Picture the scene. You've gone on holiday. You go onto Netflix. Suddenly, there's a million true crime documentaries you've never seen before. You haven't even left your hotel room by the end of the holiday. Well, now Surfshark has you covered. You now have access to 15 different Netflix libraries, all from the comfort of your own home. It also hides your IP address and increases encrypts your online information in order to safeguard your privacy. Now Surfshark are sorting you, our lovely audience, out. If you head over to surfshark.deals slash murder using the code MURDER, you'll get 84% off plus an extra four months completely free. They also have a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there literally is zero risk. So why not hit the link in the description below and start surfing the shark? And if you haven't already, why not get Surfshark? It's a crazy good deal. That's the thing. I've been all over the world on that bad boy. Um, and You've seen some things. I've seen some things. There's 342 episodes of Forensic Files available on uh, Netflix Columbia. That's a lot of files to go through. That's more files than Yorkshire Ripper had. Oh, Nearly. What is the fucking word? Palm cards. Palm cards, yeah. That's more... Oh, I'm not going to... No, yeah, yeah. you should. That's more files than the Yorkshire Ripper Police Force had of palm cards for the case. <laughs> that was, that was a long way. <laughs> it was a stretch, but it worked. Uh, I'll do it again one time. Oh, that's a lot of files, Ben. That's yeah. more files than the uh, Yorkshire Police Police... F***! <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a lot of, that's a lot of uh, episodes. Um, files. That's a lot of episodes to watch. So watch them in your own time. So today's case, Ben, is another one which I think sticks with you from well sticks from both of us as being young nippers like it's something that we heard of well i remember hearing of as being young and seeing these things but i didn't know anything the deeper levels of it all i knew was this horrific video that was doing the rounds yeah so we're covering the case of the denny propotrovsk maniacs um i'm just going to say the maniacs for this case because yeah. i struggle with saying 
just words in general. So that word is very tricky yeah. for me. I mean, even when it, I mean, we looked at it, it had been abbreviated to Dnipro. I think they've got a football team, but uh, even then, Dnipro, I I'm going to slip on that. I think I might have lost some money betting on that football team. F- um, so we're going to call them the maniacs in this case, but that's today's case. And the reasons why we decided to do that, I think, firstly, we've not seen it covered, you know, extensively anywhere else. And like you say, at the time, obviously, they're best known for the um, the viral gore video, Free Guys, One Hammer, yeah. which, yeah, is how we kind of And that was a little jokey title referring to Two Girls, One Cup. Yes. Yeah. Which another one you don't want to see. Yeah. Both of them will scar your eyes. Mm. And your mind. Hello, darkness, my old friend. So yeah, in uh, in preparing for this one, this is personally I feel by a distance the the bleakest one that that um, I've had to research and look into. It was the, the most kind of um, chaos in a short period of time. Yeah, so. I think like it, the numbers are staggering and the kind of brutality involved. Yeah, it's kind of a unreal yeah so the headline there is 21 killings in 21 days but uh, i mean even before they went on this spree in preparation for that which we're going to go on to it's dark as dark as a black hole painted black so before we get into it uh we just wanted to say a massive thank you again for all the love that we've received uh in recent weeks on the new season um, uh, the, we have obviously uh, another episode coming next week which is our big finale but until then if you can't wait we have got some lovely little minisodes over on patreon.com forward slash could murder a pod yes yeah, so we do little minisodes like Ben said we also do a Q&A on there where we discuss we answer some of your questions it's kind of just a place for having a bit of a little bit of a natter and there's also a tier just to kind of generally support the page obviously we've got we're trying to up our production value with animation. We're using this lovely studio, this really nice studio. It's a beautiful studio. And uh, obviously... Lovely shelves. A lot of you know, really nice shelves. And it's, you know, any kind of little help we really appreciate. Um, and anyone who is supporting us already, our oh, sincere gratitude toward you. Many wishes. Um, as well as that, we have these lovely mugs. Um, Not you- these ones. These ones are just for us. Yeah, look. Um, and for the audio listener, we're, we're picking up... Picking up our own mugs, which is slightly different to the ones we're selling. And the ones we're selling are on our Instagram. And just give us a little DM or an email to podcast at gmail.com and we'll we'll sort it out. We'll indulge you with a mug. We've been told they're really good to drink tea out of. Mm. Coffee, I've, I'm not sure yet, so let me no, know. I've had the same machine coffee goes mm. down. Oh, machine coffee goes down ever so well. Oh, well, there you go. So, so, I don't know about cold beverages though, so... So don't get it if you can have cold beverages. Thank you. <clears throat> so let's get into the case where we do our regular little hunt for the red flags. Yeah. So the maniacs, they consist of three boys. However, uh, the bulk of the mayhem was caused by two particular individuals. So we'll go through them one by one. In our opinion, the leader of the gang, Igor Sopronyuk, who was born on the 20th of April, 1988, His father was a pilot who spent many years flying the president of independent Ukraine around, and this was Leonid Kushma. And Viktor Sienko was the guy making up the other half of the maniacs, and he was born March the 1st, 1988. His father was a computer engineer, and he worked on public prosecutions. Um, So their parents were both, both families had very well-to-do parents, Mm -hmm. they had money, um, and their kind of parents had a bit of power within the kind of system. They they certainly had some sway. Yes, definitely, that's the word, sway. So yeah, both, they met at school, became best friends very quickly, and they very much kind of... uh, were drawn to one another. So there was a third uh, member of the Maniacs, and this was Alexander Hansa, who was born in February of 1988. Um, he lived in a slightly um, poorer part of town, um, and uh, his his father died when he was very young, so just it was just him and his mum trying to make ends meet. I mean, it's alleged that he actually lived in uh, a part of town where there were rats the size of dogs. Horrible. Horrible image. And we'll, I mean, I've seen photos, it's... That they are dog-sized rats. Really? Yeah, or rat-sized dog. No, they're dog-sized rats before I make that mistake. The former trio, um, obviously Alexander kind of growing up in a different environment. He, money was a very different thing to him. Like Igor and Victor, that they parents would you know give them money. They'd buy lots of gadgets. They got very into computers and everything at a young age. Um, Victor and Igor, um, while so young, kind of did get up to a lot of mischief together. And they once they were caught throwing uh, rocks at trains. Yeah. The police took them home. Victor's parents told him off and said, you can't see Igor anymore. He's the one leading you to trouble. And they kind of kept that going for a little while. But eventually they started hanging out again. 
and the parents didn't really bother. They weren't too invested. They just kind of trusted him um, and they started hanging out once again. So, um, I mean, it's important to mention as well that both of the boys, Igor and Victor, their parents worked a lot, so they were away a lot, so often unsupervised as well, yeah. which would obviously lead to them uh, kind of... Uh, Pushing the envelope slightly. Definitely pushing boundaries, seeing what they could do and get away with. Um, they weren't, both of them weren't very fond of school. Um, and they, you know, they enjoyed their outdoor time running around doing things, getting into mischief and just seeing exactly what they could get, get away with. Yeah. And uh, obviously technology, uh, which will, will play a part in this case, wasn't as... Um as developed as it is now, obviously. Um, so the, the the way to have fun in Ukraine at the time was to, as you say, run around the town. Before we get into it and be, get too dark with it, um, lookalikes. Mm. Do you have any for this case? I have two for Alexander, but oh, I have none for Alexander. Oh well, there you go. Well, that works go on. out quite well. Tell us who, who who they are. They're not. I, f- I will. I'll definitely go first because I feel like your two are already going to be better than mine. Um, so Alexander Hansa in the court docks. I mean, they're caged, and he's sort of posing and throwing a little bit of a vogue pose. So who's he look like? He looks like the uh, singer H or H. And there's also an American uh, rapper. I mean, you'll find it funnier when I throw the photo up because it. This one's pretty good, but uh, there's an American rapper called Token who is this sp- spitting image of him. So that's why I went first. Uh, Victor Selenko, I think, looks like one of the vice presenters, the one that does the one-star reviews. I think it looks a little like, like, like him. Igor looks like a Vladimir Smyser. But the Liverpool player. Yeah, but also um, a friend of ours has, said he looks a little bit like Josh Harnett. Which... Oh, God. I think it's fairly 30 sharp. days and 30 nights or whatever. Yeah? Yeah. 21 killings in 21 days. So there's a bit of a theme there. So the three boys form a trio. Uh, they spend as much time as, as they can together uh, avoiding school and avoiding studying, so roaming around the streets of Dnipro. And um, this is where they kind of agree that they all have kind of uh, fears that they, they decide the best way to overcome them is by facing them head on, which is pretty solid advice. However, in the context of this case, it's grim. Yeah, they, uh, they had a fear of heights. So what they do is they climb to the highest point they could get to and stay there for hours and try and conquer the fear of heights, which apparently did work. Yeah, it was like abandoned apartment buildings and stuff like that. Though. Yeah, so it's kind of them pushing the envelope here, you know, climbing to the, the height of the water towers or high abandoned buildings. They're also just kind of like getting the adrenaline and the kick and the, the blood rush that they're after. And they're like, okay, this works. We want more of this. And then Victor had a fear of blood. So following on from that example of how to overcome your fears, how would you go about getting rid of the fear of blood? Go on holiday with a vampire. What well, holiday? Just thought it'd be nice. <laughs> yeah? Go over a fear. Have an all-inclusive. Well, not with a vampire, I hope. If I was trying to do the thing of trying to get over the fear of it, maybe donate blood. You see your own blood, people around you giving blood, it's and like, it's nice. Huh? It's likely you'd faint either way. You ever given blood? Yeah, a few times. Oh yeah. So in order to overcome their their fear of blood, they decide to capture and torture uh, stray dogs and stray cats uh, across the streets of Dnipro, which is, as an animal lover, absolutely heartbreaking uh, to imagine. And there was a particular case where they caught a white cat, and in one of the boys' garages, they um, they nailed the cat to a cross and then shot the cat while it had been crucified with uh, a gun loaded only with rubber bullets um, and they filmed the whole thing which yeah. is just absolutely I mean, scum it's a, it's a very common thing isn't it for um, killers to kind of start on animals and kind of work their way up I mean, you know Ed Kemper killing multiple family cats um, and there's lots of other, other cases where they kind of say this is what usually leads on to being a, becoming a serial killer it is the kind of taking lives and learning about it and getting more fascinated and they want to they want to step up and do the next big you know build themselves up to killing humans so it's kind of immediately that's a huge you know red flag straight away yeah i mean there's Um, loads of photos that they would capture of themselves either proudly hanging dogs and cats and they would photo themselves doing kind of nazi salutes or or giving the finger to the 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 dead animals it's just it's it's heartbreaking with the nazi salutes you um saying about the one of them actually shared their birthday with Hitler. Yeah, Igor. And he was very, very happy of the fact that uh, he was born on April 20th. Um, there's multiple photos of him um, having paint, painted a, um, is it a handlebar? No, not handlebar. Toothbrush. Charlie Chaplin moustache. Um, 
and um, he's kind of the, in a few other photos as well doing the the Nazi salute. So very proud and, and happy to be associated with Hitler, which uh, again would summarise his character fairly well. Yeah, so with the Conquering Fears, I kind of thought, obviously they've gone a certain route with it. I, I, I had a little Google to see, you know, what was alternatives to what they could have done. Mm. Um, I didn't Google specifically Fear of Blood. I think Fear of Blood is an odd thing anyway in itself. Vampire Holiday. It writes itself. Yeah, I don't know if it does write itself. It feels a bit... <laughs> <laughs> um, but once you start thinking about what they go on to do and you read these kind of ideas, it sounds so much sinister. Prepare, practice, role play, educate yourself. We are afraid of nothing so much as the unknown. It's like those kind of things, understand fear and embrace it. Embrace fear as instruction and let it inform your actions, but not control them. All these things mm-hmm. when you read it in their voice, it just sounds creepy and sounds like they went on to do these things because it was going to cure them of the fear. But it was just an excuse, wasn't it, for them to be, they were blood hungry, they wanted to commit these crimes and they, yeah, we'll get into it. We'll get get into it. Yeah, so multiple, um, multiple um, killings would occur with animals and uh, they would often film uh, this uh, with their with their smartphones and save it to their their computers so they were they were at the kind of forefront of new technology as as we mentioned their parents were really well to do had good good uh, good forms of employment so would spoil them dote on the boys well i think as well as cuz you like you said that they they were absent for a lot of time yeah it's just one of those things of oh we're not here but have this yeah we, we're providing them with all the all the things they could ever need so we're not be you know we're not neglecting them as children um yeah my question here is to face the fear of blood why was once not enough yeah i mean yeah that's completely right i mean it's 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 an excuse isn't it i mean i don't know how many times they were dangling off a balcony but yeah multiple cats and dogs it's, it's heartbreaking heartbreaking so in facing their fears they become more confident um, and a little bit more bullish as they're walking around. And uh, this leads to Igor beating up another child within an inch of his life in order to steal his bicycle, which he would then go on to sell to Victor. Again, he was never charged for this, despite the parents of the boy he'd beaten, you know, going to the local police. Well, this is a, this is one of the themes that run throughout. The, the parents' sway were able yeah. to get them, you know, oh, you know, he's, he's, he's being a bit, you know, naughty, he had a fight. And then they, get, they, they brushed it under the carpet. Yeah, yeah, that's it. So of the many uh, stray animals that they would um, capture, torture, slaughter, they would also, um, it was proven in some of the photos, which are horrific, that they would take the blood from the animals and paint uh, swastikas onto trees and, and fences. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's one of those where, as well, you feel like they're thinking, oh, this, we're being so rebellious. What's the most rebellious image that we could do with, with, with the blood is, is, yeah. is doing that. They also got very obsessed with gore websites, looking at people being killed or mass, uh, or like, you know, people being um, executed yeah. or pictures of just dead dead bodies. They got really obsessed with that. And they were thinking with these with these images that we're creating, we can do a similar thing. Yeah. Um, and I think that probably spurred them on, you know, wanting to, oh, I want to try that, I want to do that. And, yeah. and push no them No parents looking at your browser history either. So as their confidence is rising, they're continually su- surrounding themselves with gore sites and 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 Nazi uh, memorabilia and bits like that. Um, the trio at the age of seventeen in two thousand and five would go to go on to beat two fifteen year old boys within an inch of their lives. Um, the two fifteen year old boys suffered concussions, broken bones, and permanently disfigured faces. The parents of the boys tried to press charges, but again, Eagle's well connected father intervened, and the boys simply had a stern talking to. Um, now, as this, uh, as as the years would go on, the the boys all finished school. Uh, so Victor became a security guard. Eagle became a taxi driver, which was unlicensed, so um, against the law. Um, <laughs> um, but he would drive around in a green Dyewood taxi, um, and Alexander was unemployed. So they would uh, all three boys would use Eagle's taxi to drive around town and pick people up, who they would then go on to to, to rob. Um, Igor and Victor didn't do it for a financial uh, uh, reason. Uh, however, Alexander did do it for necessity due to being unemployed. Yeah. Um, obviously, things are escalating very, very quickly. And in 2007, um, Alexander claims that he left the group. So yeah. he'd only really been involved in a few of the kind of drive-by burglaries. Yeah. From the you know from the from the research, you kind of see paints a picture that he very much was there for you know, he was hanging out with the rich kids and he was kind of, he did what he needed to do to get by and help, not 
at all excusing you know the robberies and whatnot but he did this he's he grew up in a single parent home so he was trying to you know make ends meet with, with his mum um so he, he kind of saw this escalating and he's like i don't want to be any part of this so he took a step back so now we're going to jump into the timeline of these 21 days of murder there's a lot of names in here which we're gonna have a right little time of saying but um let's get into it so as we mentioned at the start, 21 murders in 21 days. Igor and Victor now have a bit of a bloodlust. I think that would be fair to say. And uh, and this is where their spree really begins. On June 25th, 2007, late at night, Igor and Victor claim their first victim. They are prowling the streets. They see a 33-year-old woman who, who is a university teacher called Yekaterina Ilchenko, who was walking home after having dinner at her best friend's apartment. According to Victor's later confession, he and Igor were simply out for a walk. Igor had a hammer, and as Ilchenko walked past, Igor spun around and hit her in the side of the head. Ilchenko's body was found by her mother at 5am the next morning. She claims that she woke up, and this is a little bit spooky, at 4.30am, knowing something wasn't right before finding her daughter's body just outside of her building. She said to reporters there was no face, only part of it. So obviously yeah, it's, a, it's a horrible scene obviously to find, especially yeah, the pure like mutilation, even you know, the, earlier on mentioned with the, uh, the beating up of kids with their fists, they disfigured their faces permanently. So obviously them using a weapon is, is obviously gonna be a lot more impactful. So later that same night, within an hour of the first murder, Igor and Victor attack their next victim, and that was 45-year-old Roman Tatarevich. He was a homeless man who had dozed off after a drinking session on a park bench, um, which was just around the corner from the first murder scene. Tatarevich's head was smashed with a blunt object numerous times, rendering him unrecognisable. The bench was located across the street from the local public prosecutor's office. The boys also attacked 58-year-old Viktor Pertsev, who was smashed in the face multiple times with a blunt object. However, a woman from a nearby hair salon started sounding the alarm and the maniacs fled. Um, he would go on to survive. Yes, I mean, you think all of that in one night. I mean, they've got away with these crimes before. They have been swept on the carpet, but um, they've just gone, you know, they're literally is the bloodlust they've got isn't it they're just going out there and they can't control it they're seeing someone they're acting immediately they're not they're not bothering do, you know, they could do it public can do it down these these streets that they don't care where they do it mm -hmm. they just have to act and it seems like Igor may be the kind of leader here or taking the initiative um but either way um it, it seems that the um victor definitely had involvement um at least with one of the other two victims on June 28, 2007, Igor and Victor went on to murder 69-year-old Alexei Kovbasa and 53-year-old Valery Kriopspitsky. Both victims are discovered with multiple bludgeons and stab wounds in the local area. July 1, 2007, the boys claim two more victims. Yevgenia Grischenko and Nikolai Serchuk were both found murdered in the nearby town of Novomoskovsk. They were both beaten so badly with a blunt object that their skulls had split. So July the 6th, 2007, this is their most rampageous day yet. Victor had spent the evening at his girlfriend's house and called Igor to come and collect him. They agreed to go on a robbery drive to earn some extra money. This would result in three more people being murdered in Dnipro. The first was Igor Nekvaloda, a recently discharged army recruit who had spent the night clubbing and drinking with friends. While making his way home, the maniacs bludgeoned Igor to death by attacking him from behind, just yards from his house. His mother discovered the body in the morning by the entrance of their apartment building. Igor was found to have been struck over 15 times with a hammer. His killers also wrote a swastika on his forehead. An hour later, Yelena Shram, a 28-year-old night guard, was then murdered around the corner from Nekoloda's body. She had left her night shift a couple of hours after not feeling very well and was only a couple streets away from her home. According to Victor's later tape confession, as Shram walked towards them, Iga struck her with a hammer. He had been hiding under a shirt and then proceeded to hit her multiple times until she fell onto the floor. According to the victim's mother, um, she later stated, there was not a part of her that was not destroyed. When we went to the morgue to identify her, we couldn't, apart from through her hair and her clothes. Yeah, that just kind of paints a picture of exactly the kind of force and like, how relentless they were once they kind of imagine that though you find that with a lot of these cases with with stabbings once the, you know the, the person has actually you know passed on that doesn't stop that that doesn't stop them they're still you know constantly 
hitting, stabbing, all those things, they carry on. They're, they just obviously see red and it's just that rage comes out. It's, it's truly scary. Well, that's the thing about these these guys, um, these boys. Um, in terms of a motive, they're not robbing these victims. There's no sexual implication. Uh, it, it's simply because they can, which is terrifying and yeah, I, th- I, I think it's just, yeah, it's the power thing, isn't it? It's them wanting to be the highest in the food chain and then just they're picking off people, you know, homeless people, uh, women walking late at night. Yeah. They're going after people that they know they, they can have a power, especially with two of them, and with a weapon. Um, Within hours of, of previous victims as well. So it's not like, you know, one is enough of a rush for them yeah. to kind of keep them stimulated. They are on an absolute... <laughs> it's... Yeah. Rampage, they're yeah. on absolute. So later on that same night, they went on to murder a 51-year-old woman named Valentina Hansa. No relation to co-defendant Alexander Hansa. She was a mother of three and a sole carer for her disabled husband. So the police didn't link this to the previous nine killings and no warning is shared within the city. Which is crazy. So that's nine killings in like a, a week or a week, just over a week. Yeah. And the police aren't really too... Again, that's another thing that has happened in multiple cases we've done. The police don't tend to go... You know, full alarm. Tell everyone, watch out. They, yeah, they or feel, even make people aware because I guess it would, it wasn't making major news at the time that there was a killer or killers on mm. the loose, especially something so brutal. Nine killings, nine lives lost. It's one of those things. Where obviously, you don't want to make you don't want to sell your town as an unsafe place, a place you don't want people to visit. You know, you <laughs> there probably is a conscious effort there to try and be like, oh well, we can if we can solve this case in the next few days, this doesn't need to be reported yeah. in such to in such an extent. But yeah. I mean, multiple deaths could have been, you know, avoided if they did actually put the warning out there. So that brings us to July 7th, 2007. And this is the particular uh, moment of the case that we used in our episode introduction. So two 14-year-old boys from a nearby town had woken up extra early to go and catch fish for their mothers. There was a third member of of, of the the fishing group. Um, However, um, against what we just said about the police... um, that boy's mother had advised the boy not to go out and not yeah, to leave the house. She had so. a feeling that, you know, it would be safe for him to stay home. Yeah, so well done that lady. So the boys are biking along a country road in the early hours. It's before sunrise and they are overtaken by a green Dywood taxi. Yeah. Taxi pulls up and two people get out of, out of the taxi and stand in the middle of the road. As the boys approach on their bicycles, they are viciously attacked with a hammer. One of the two friends, Andre Sidiuk, was killed and becomes the maniac's 10th victim. But the other, and I feel so, so bad for this boy as we'll we'll go on to explain, but the other, Vadim Lyakov, managed to escape and hide in the woods. Yeah. And after hiding in the woods for over an hour while the car was kind of apparently up and down the road, which is terrifying in itself, the car then vanishes and, and, and heads off so he runs back to his friend who is still alive and still responsive and uh, and tries to um, kind of stem the bleeding um, I mean this is a 14 year old boy and, his, and one of his good friends is dying in front of him Yeah, he runs to a nearby motorway and flags down a car I mean even in the back of his mind, in the back of his mind, you know, hopefully not a green diewood taxi is being waved down. Well, that's the thing. Yeah, he, he, he's obviously going to be petrified of that happening, but he's trying to save his his best friend. So yeah, he's yesterday or yesterday. And that that's unfortunately not even the worst of it. So he he manages to flag a stranger down who comes to help take his friend to the hospital. Now, when he arrives at the hospital, he's obviously dealing with the trauma that he's just endured of Mm. seeing his friend get attacked, hiding in the woods, avoiding being attacked himself, trying to save his friend's life. Police immediately pin it on him and begin to interrogate him. 14-year-old boy, and apparently it was a physically aggressive interrogation, so they would beat him and and prod him with um, truncheons. It was not a nice situation to be yeah they put, you know straight away into like an hours and hours of interviewing him and he's keeping to his story and yeah and they've been very forceful they didn't even let him call his mother the mother eventually threatened to go to the public prosecutor which caused the police to release him because um you know she believed her son and she knew that he, the best friends and something he would never do um so the police you know started listening to what the story was then mm-hmm. which uh you know the police i don't know why the police wouldn't believe him straight away um but yeah it's, it's, a, it's a horrible image for that that boy to go through now, after this event, they've now claimed 10 victims. Um, the boy would later succumb to his wounds in hospital and uh, unfortunately pass away. News spreads across the city of multiple murders with a serial killer and or killers still on the loose, with locals dubbing him or her or them 
the Dnipropetrovsk maniacs. So July 11th, 2007, Igor and Victor claimed two additional victims. So even with the news coming out and, you know, it being reported about them, they, it wasn't making them, you know, want to quit what they're doing. They didn't get scared by it. They, no fear. They faced all their fears. If anything, they were, you know, proud of what they'd done and they liked the kind of being known around and knowing it's them, kind of like the little secret they had between themselves. Yeah, it oddly spurred them on. Yeah, so they went on to kill 53-year-old Nikolai Pashinko and an unidentified middle to late-aged male thought to be homeless. Both men were found with multiple wounds to the back of the head and face. So the very next day, July 12, 2007, this brings us to the infamous Free Guys One Hammer yep. video. Um, 48-year-old Sergei Yatzenko, a man who had cheated death twice before, once when accidentally driving a tractor into a river, and he stayed on the tractor to try and save the tractor from uh, from losing the goods on board because the tractor belonged to his employer. Okay. He wanted to make sure that the employer didn't lose money there, so that speaks volumes of his character. And the second time went overcoming an almost fatal tumour. So he was a massive family man and a loving father and, uh, you know, a new grandfather. So spent a lot of time with his uh, children and grandchildren. Sergei had been disabled by a recent bout with cancer, which impacted his speech. He went missing while riding his Dnipra motorcycle. His battered body was found four days later with signs of a savage attack visible even after four days in the summer heat. This incident would later go on to become globally viral on gore sites under the name Free Guys One Hammer. Yeah, this is the one, as I said, like at school, you know, those kind of videos do circulate. People, you know, want to shock their friends by showing them certain things. And this is definitely one of those videos which circulated around my school. Um, and it, it did yours as well. Okay. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's one of those where, you know, I think I clicked on it, but I can watch it. Yeah. Um, I know it's been reported like Kaylin Moran watched it and there's news reports about her, her watching it and it got weird public like it got re weird publicity over in the UK and it's one of those that did spread and did spread their name yeah and like you say reaction videos did a lot to kind of push that you know even yeah. to, a, to a more viral level I tried to watch it um, about what 10 10 years ago 11 I can't remember I tried to watch it when, you know at the time but like you I couldn't I couldn't get anywhere near through it. It was disgusting, disgusting. I mean, even in preparation for this, there were documentaries I watched where they show you the kind of the first yeah. when he's on his bike and they they strike him. And yeah, it's, it's just heartbreaking. It's, it's disgusting. Yeah. I think it's a bit out of order for documentaries to include that in, to be honest. Well, well. that's it. There was a, a very uh, infamous Chilean documentary that, that got access to, I don't know how they did this, but they got access to footage and some of the footage that the boys had filmed as well that no one else had access to. Right. And they got exclusive interviews with relatives of the victims, relatives of the boys' family. If you can put up with the subtitles and the, the um, kind of low quality resolution, it's, it's worth a watch, but it's... Uh, yeah, it was a very interesting uh, documentary. So later on that day, the maniacs brutally murdered 85-year-old Regina Propenko just outside of her home. July 13th, 2007, Igor and Victor murder Nikolai Mariancikova in the deep Dnipro area. So on the 14th of July, 2007, 45-year-old Natalia Mamachak was riding her scooter in the nearby village of Diovka. As she was passing through a wooded area, two men approached her and knocked her down from a scooter. They then bludgeoned her to death with a hammer and pipe and drove off on the scooter. Local witnesses gave chase but lost sight of the attackers. So, yeah, doing this during daytime in front of people. So, they, you know, they've just upped the ante even more and they just don't care. Yeah, cra absolutely crazy image to imagine. And, uh, yeah, I mean, a majority of these crimes are committed during broad daylight as well. How were they not... Um any photo fits or mock-ups made of them or, you know, uh, witness Even just statements. general surveillance, you would have thought, yeah. like... A number be... plate would have been handy. Mm, true. And over the next two days, they would claim an additional two victims. So later on that month, the boys went on to murder an unnamed pregnant woman, and she is bludgeoned to death, and she is stabbed, and she has her fetus ripped from the womb. Which, it's just horror movie level. It's... The boys would also attack a 70-year-old lady in the head with a hammer twice while she was walking with her three dogs. Igor and Victor took turns in kicking her face, potentially trying to dislodge gold teeth from her mouth, which is just... 
And they didn't need it. They didn't need the money. They didn't, yeah, exactly. Um, so absolutely hideous. The dogs were trying to protect their owner and uh, and they uh, attacked the boys. However, the boys pulled out guns and shot two of the dogs to death um, with rubber bullets before fleeing. They also injured the third dog. So, I mean, this is a point. They have guns on them, yeah. but they're choosing not to use them because obviously they prefer to go down the more barbaric route of yeah, using I mean, a hammer and knives. Yeah, like we know, they're not killing for money. They're not kill- They're killing for pleasure. And I imagine they want to, you know, get you know get everything out of it. And that's the way they see that is using the hammer, blunt objects. It's not using the gun. Um, yeah, it just it just highlights that definitely. So they're keeping the gun on them, not for, we well, just for with rubber bullets as well. Well, it just shows you that they they were scared of the dogs attacking them. And they used the gun, but they never felt threatened enough from the people they're attacking to use it. Um, and then yeah, on the, the, the final victim. Um, Later on in that month was an unnamed middle-aged homeless man who was bludgeoned to death of being struck in the head. So a final note, Vadim, um, the young boy who witnessed his friend being murdered, um, was so traumatised by the events, um, by first of all witnessing his friend being killed, trying to save his life unsuccessfully. Being accused by the police to being the one who did it. Yeah, being physically abused by the police. Um, he was so traumatised by the whole uh, the whole process that um, his mother... Um, forbid him from going to his friend's funeral. Yeah, it's horrible. However, the slight blessing of this is that, well, it depends which way you view it, but had he attended the funeral, he would have recognised two uninvited guests at this funeral. So Victor and Igor had opted to attend that funeral, potentially looking um, uh, potentially looking for um, Vadim. Yeah, I think, well, the way, you know, obviously it's, it's a very common thing, Ian Huntley making himself part of the search, kind of appreciating his own work, thinking of them going to the funerals. I wouldn't be surprised if they attended any of the other funerals, to be honest, the, yeah. the, way, the way they are well, with they, this whole thing. They photograph themselves uh, giving the finger and doing Nazi salutes to various gravestones, yeah. headstones. I think I even saw one where they were somehow in a morgue with one of their victims and swearing at the dead Surely body. Surely not. Yeah. Yeah, so then being there, if the, if the boy did attend, obviously he would have he would have been able to, to name that them. Have, yeah, but I can completely understand the mum's point of view, not wanting him to go through any more suffering and more trauma. And the police manhunt would intensify, and the whole city pretty much shuts down in fear. So again, we're still in July. I mean, that's the crazy part of of this whole case. It's so rapid. It's it's you know twenty one days, as we say. Um, a task force is quickly set up. I mean, they decide to do something now that 21 people have died. Um, and they actually bring in a task force from Kiev, um, headed by lead criminal investigator Vasily Paskalov. The manhunt soon grew to encompass most local law enforcement and reportedly over 2,000 investigators from different cities worked on the case. Yeah, that's a lot of manpower. The investigation was initially kept secret um, and no official information about the murders was released to the public and local people were not warned about the fact that there were possible multiple attackers on their streets. Um, Eventually, investigators selectively distributed sketches and lists of stolen property to local pawn shops and soon stolen property began to be identified in the pawn shops in the city's Leninsky district. Yeah, so... As we said, they're so callous. They weren't doing this for money, but you know, occasionally they would sell some items to pawn shops and whatnot because they thought, why not? They did keep some things as trophies as well. And the way they actually get found out is fairly <sighs> not comical. It's just a, such a stupid mistake yeah. from their part. Yeah, it's slightly um, is reminiscent of the um, Luca Magnata. Don't fuck with cats. Yeah, Luca yeah. Magnata. Yes, yeah, it's, it's slightly reminds me of that. So 23rd of July 2007, Eagle had attempted to sell a mobile phone stolen from a victim in a local pawn shop, asking for 150. What currency is that, Tom? <sighs> Harinu. 150 Harinu, which is around 30 US dollars in 2007. The law enforcement agents tracked the phone's location once the shop owner turned it on to check its functionality. So literally, they turned it on, kind of the signals then beeped around. The police go there to find the stolen phone. Who sold you the phone? It was Igor and Victor. Um, So that's how they were undone. So as you say, very, very reminiscent of uh, the Luca Magnata case where he's Googling himself in an internet cafe. Yeah. (laughs) But as well as Victor and Igor being arrested, so was Alexander Hansa. 
Yeah, so he was initially involved in a lot of the uh, the robberies and um, and uh, physical assaults, but but would go on to you know um, outright deny any involvement in any of the murders. Yeah, but they still pin based on the um, the pawn shop uh, feedback, they still pin some of the charges on him. Yeah, so he is also collected. Okay, so August 2007, the three men are charged with involvement in 29 separate incidents, including 21 murders and eight more attacks where victims survived. Igor, who we uh, we have identified as we think a bit of the ringleader, was charged with 27 of the cases, including 21 counts of capital murder, eight armed robberies, and one count of animal cruelty. Yeah. One count. I guess it might be hard to prove. I mean, obviously with pictures, I guess there's a lot of pictures. So yeah, that is that is a bit. Mm. Victor was charged with 25 instances, including 18 murders, five robberies, and one count of animal cruelty. Alexander Hansa was charged with two counts of armed robberies stemming from a March 1st, 2007 incident in Dnipro. So as we mentioned earlier on, Victor and Igor, his family had a lot of... Um, sway in the government and they're able to kind of push things under the rug when they wanted to obviously with this evidence that was emerging it's very hard for them to fight that battle one of the weird things that they tried to claim was essentially that this being pinned on them by people yeah. who even even had higher parents like parents yeah. higher up than them that could even move this onto them yeah they were outright refusing that it was them in all the video and photo photographic evidence yeah at the trial it actually emerged that Igor had collected newspaper cuttings about the case and some of the photographs of the crimes and captures included the weak must die, the strongest must conquer. So, you know, he was looking at this as very much as a, you know, he's, he's they're the stronger, they're the alpha males, they can do what they want. Um, and the, obviously all the evidence from their videos and the photographs were taken into court. The, one of the, another one of the defence claims was, obviously you can, you can doctor a photograph. Yeah. I mean, this podcast has not been shy at doing that with yep. some uh, comedic relevance. Yeah. The doctor is in the house. I'm pointing at Tom for those... Joining us, yeah. I'd be us, the doctor. But they were trying to claim back then, and this what this is two thousand and eight, that um, the the footage, the video footage, was doctored. Yeah, so it's slightly more challenging. Yeah, I mean, he, like the amount of money it would take to change the faces on those people, on the people in the video, is absolutely insane. So they they're trying to use that as a as a as a way to get out. Going, oh, that's what. Yeah, it looks like them because it's been edited by. Pixar. Mm. So um, it's insane. But yeah, they try to use that as a, as a defense. Um, and yeah, luckily it didn't it didn't hold up. Victor Sayenko's defense claimed that he had a psychological dependence on Igor, who they who they believed to be the ringleader. They claimed that um, Igor had threatened um, Victor as a kid and he had feared for his life since the seventh grade. So trying to say that obviously all of this was all Igor and Victor just because he was scared to death about him killing him. Which, I mean... It's, it's not entirely impossible. It's not. It's not. It's not implausible. But I guess it's one of those things where once these things start happening, he's still carrying out these acts, and it seems to be willingly going out and doing those. So it's just. It's probably an obvious defense to use. Oh no, it wasn't me. I was forced to do these things. So Igor's original defense lawyer um, left the case after reportedly being disappointed that his client's plea for insanity was not accepted. So initially, the boys were very much uh, um, after confessing. Um, confessing on the the basis that of course they're insane yeah i mean we're maniacs so it kind of comes with the territory one of the things eagles uh, parents were saying the reason why his son did admit to these murders was because of the police uh you know forcing him to do things and one of the odd things that they claimed that they did was was forcing him to inhale cigarette smoke so you hear about these ways that people keep people up for hours keeping them in for hours not feeding them all these things going eagle smoke this or just blowing it in his face. Yeah, but it's, it's not really... It's a very odd claim to make. So prosecution evidence included bloodstains on the suspect's clothing and video recordings. The case was heard by a panel of judges chaired by Judge Ivan Senchenko. The prosecution asked for life imprisonment for Sienko and Soprunyuk and 15 years of hard labour for Hansa. There's a punishment there. Ukraine has no capital punishment since February 2000. On 11th of February 2009, the court in Dnipro found Igor and Victor guilty of premeditated murder and sentenced both of them to life imprisonment. Um, Igor was found guilty of 21 murders, while Victor was found guilty of 18 of them. 
Um, they also uh, received 15-year sentences after being found guilty on the robbery charges. Alexander Hansa, who was not involved in any of the killings, was found guilty of robbery and sentenced to nine years in prison. An opinion poll was conducted in Dnipro and they found that 50.3% of people believe that the sentence was fair and 486 believe that the sentence should have been more severe. As of uh, 2019, Alexander Hansa has uh, been released and said to um, have started a family of his own, while Victor and Eager thankfully remain on their life sentence. Yeah, so following on from this, there has been a copycat attempt uh, in, in April 2011. Two Russian youths um, known as the Academy Maniacs, I'm not going to say their names, I don't want to glamorise them, were arrested in connection with six murders and attacks using a mallet and a knife. And again, they would prey on the weak, they would record it on their phones, and you know it's been heavily um, heavily suggested that they've done this after seeing all these, hearing all the, all the stuff about about the case. So, uh, yeah. Well, today it's arguably Ukraine's most... Um, most famous killing spree well it must be in, in regards to the amount of murders in quick concession but even Chikatilo was Ukrainian wasn't he yeah yeah but I think they kind of pushed that onto the old red nation um, so motives then well as we as we established the motive wasn't money uh, it seems to be just to quench a blood for, a, a lust that's why I've taken out of it it, it doesn't ever seem to be yeah, they were selling the phones and whatnot, but I, I, they they also kept a lot of the stuff as trophies. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of things were found when the police searched the houses and found those things and those items. So I can't see a real clear motive there. So there was um, another motive um, suggested, um, which was financial, and this was that they had been... Um, Based on their free, frequent visits to uh, gore sites, they'd, they'd actually been put in touch with... Um, it's snuff movie makers that yeah. were willing to pay top dollar for um, grainy snuff footage. So for people who don't know what snuff movies are, oh, um, it's essentially a video where you see someone being killed, isn't it? Perfect. Yeah, I couldn't have said it. Obviously, there's a black market out there of people who want to see that kind of disgusting thing. And it has been, yeah, it's been thought that that possibly was an avenue, but it seems to be quite muted, that idea. As an, it's, it, there was no, they really couldn't find any evidence of them talking to anyone, any emails between people discussing prices. It was just, a, it. It was yeah. just an idea as, why would these people film it? Well, not just for their own pleasure, there must be another motive and it's, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, local media had reported that the killers had a plan to get rich from the murder videos they recorded. One of the suspect's girlfriends reported that they planned to make up to 40 separate videos of murders. This was corroborated by a former classmate who claimed he often heard Igor was in contact with an unknown, rich foreign website operator who ordered ordered just cook me up 40 snuff movies so surely if the girlfriend's talking about it and the classmates talking about it that's a bit like i know obviously if they are going killing people they're going to be worried and scared about uh, you know being approached by them if they go around talking about them or even accusing them of doing it but you kind of feel like if they know this much why haven't they said something a bit sooner regional security chief ivan stupak rejected the claim that the murders were committed to make the internet snuff videos saying that there was no evidence of this they would even go on to get detective bogdan vlastenko um, to state that we think they were doing it as a hobby to have a collection of memories when they get old yeah which is a horrible way of putting it but that's what that seems to be the uh, mm. the, the reason they're doing it they're doing it because they wanted the trophies and they wanted to but i mean i think it would be foolish to assume that they were planning to stop when they stopped um i think they would have continued and probably got more brash with the the way they went about it yeah. um and i think the parents didn't help obviously left them unsupervised most of the time um anytime they did get you know brought home by the police or any accusations or um, allegations against them they were quick to use their uh, their sway patter yeah patter um and um i think yeah that obviously allowed the boys to go on misbehaving and and uh <laughs> misbehaving yeah being naughty boy no um but they they everything was an escalation and um We've not really done a case quite like this before. Yeah, I'm not sure where that could have escalated to even further, but I mean, obviously the more people they kill, that's, that's the escalation within itself. Um, the sheer amount of people killed in that short period of time is absolutely like it's unheard. Well, in the cases we've covered, that's, you know, 
that's definitely out there. So that was the case of the Denny Propotrovsk Maniacs. Yes, the penultimate episode of the series. Next week is our final episode of series two, so be sure to come back then. It's a biggie. It is a biggie. It is, and it's one again that's been requested by a lot of people. So um, we look forward to sharing that one with you. In the meantime, uh, we'll be posting daily updates on our Insta page, which is at Could Murder a Pod. Uh, the very same handle for our Twitter page, at Could Murder a Pod. If you're looking to pass some time and looking uh, for some additional content from Ben and Tom, your old friends here, then why not hit us up on our Patreon page, which is Patreon slash, you've guessed it, Could Murder a Pod. So we're off now. <laughs> uh. So until next time, we'll see you soon. Stay lovely. No. Do I have to say stay lovely? So until next time, we'll see you. That was that's pretty good. That was that's pretty the good. one, yeah. All right, guys. Don't have to copy me. <laughs>